there are few things more captivating than secrets from ancient civilizations that are now lost to time. Perhaps the most infamous example of that is Greek fire. A fearsome weapon with a supposed recipe lost to time, never able to be replicated again, despite the attempts of alchemists and chemists for centuries since. But does reality stand up to this myth? In this video, I'm on a quest to see just what it would take to recreate this lost recipe. I travel the country to locate some of the needed ingredients, and I'm going to do something that many alchemists of the past never seem to bother with, actually putting these recipes to the test. Greek fire was an incendiary weapon used by the Eastern Roman Empire from the 7th to 14th century that was supposedly crucial for its defense. Its recipe was a tightly held state-kept secret that when the empire fell, was lost forever. The exact details of this weapon are surrounded by so much myth and speculation, it's hard to really understand what exactly we are looking for with Greek fire. So for some help, I reached out to someone who's extensively studied this topic and thinks they have the most probable theory on what Greek fire actually was. My name's John Halden. I'm Emeritus Professor of Byzantine History and Hellenic Studies at Princeton University. So I'm interested in kind of the history and background with Greek fire. Can you kind of tell me like what, what the story of Greek fire and Byzantine world <laughs> why the recipe is like such a big secret today? Firstly, uh, Greek fire is a sort of Western medieval term coined by the Crusaders in the 12th century. And they applied it generally to any sort of incendiary weapon. The machine or the device that I think you're interested in is actually the, the Greeks obviously didn't call it Greek fire. Uh, they didn't call themselves Greeks either, so <laughs> it wouldn't be a very helpful uh, term. But they called it liquid fire. And basically it's a sort of medieval napalm. So it was projected um, through a pump, relatively short range. It's obviously something of a terror weapon. We know from the experiments that we carried out when we built a machine, using an aerial thermometer, the oil that's projected comes out at roughly 1400 degrees centigrade. So that's wow. really hot. <laughs> What do we know about Greek fire and like the characteristics of how it was described and such? Obviously, incendiary weapons launched from catapults and thrown by hand to been around since people started fighting each other using fire. What's new and revolutionary about this is that it's actually a flamethrower, effectively. How does it work? For a long time, people were looking for quote-unquote recipes. One argument was that it's actually uh, maybe an early form of combination of saltpeter and other materials to make a type of early gunpowder. Already in the Crusader period, they were trying to work out what it was and Alchemists were coming up with a whole range of theories. It's supposed to have included the most unlikely, uh, with all sorts of things mixed into it, none of which actually work. I mean, if, if you actually would try and put some of these things together, you get a damp squid at the very most. We know that the main element was crude oil. There's no doubt about that. That's absolutely crystal clear. They described the type of oil and the color of the oil, sometimes described sticky fire which is why I mentioned it's a sort of napalm, because it clearly adheres when it strikes something. And so the only uh, sort of thing you can add uh, that would have that impact without uh, damaging its other properties of projection ability is something like pine resin or pine oil, which of course is very, very flammable. Mm -hmm. And one Latin recipe uh, mentions this. And then you mentioned that like the this technology just disappeared at one point. Uh, what was the reason for that? So basically, it's a political story. The Byzantines lose control of the areas where they get the oil from. Now you'd think, okay, so why didn't somebody else build it? But the only answer I think that works is that the, the Byzantines did manage to keep the actual projection system more or less secret. So I think it's a combination of not having access to the oil uh, and then mm -hmm. other people not knowing how the device actually worked, even if they had one. So our theory works. It, it accommodates all the information without any contradictions. And mm -hmm. the, all the stories about the recipes and the secret recipe and, and all the rest uh, are effectively um, probably mostly Crusader and Western European myths after the whole thing was lost and it was a sort of mysterious weapon of the past. Well, first, thank you to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. I know from personal experience that there are often times when you need some outside help to help you get through some difficult situations. Trying to handle your struggles on your own is a heavy burden and getting professional help can be all the difference in the world. Whether through BetterHelp or other avenues, it's incredible how seeking professional help can make a real difference. So the very first step of just finding a therapist can be kind of the largest burden to overcome. But today's sponsor, BetterHelp, can make those first steps super easy by connecting you with a licensed therapist best suited for your needs. You can take the first steps by heading to their site, betterhelp.com slash htme, 
BetterHelp matches you with an experienced professional tailored to your needs. The best part, you can engage with your therapist from the comfort of your own space through messaging, phone calls, or video chat. BetterHelp usually matches you within 48 hours, ensuring a swift start to your mental health journey. Let BetterHelp be your guide to a better and happier you. Visit betterhelp.com slash HTME or choose HTME during your sign up for an exclusive discount on your first month. Remember, mental health matters and taking that first step is a sign of strength. Thanks to John Heldon, I now have a much better idea of what Greek fire is. That basically what we're looking for is an ancient form of napalm. Heldon also suggested that the real secret to Greek fire wasn't the recipe itself, but the actual delivery device of the weapon. For this video, I'm only going to focus on the recipe itself and testing and comparing different ingredients. Once we settle on a winner, we'll move on to actually building the ancient flamethrower. So the main things that seem to distinguish and define Greek fire from other incendiaries are it burned on water, possibly being ignited by water. It was a liquid substance, not a projectile. It was sticky and would stick to you. It was hard to extinguish and possibly it was accompanied by thunder and much smoke. Lots of chemicals have been suggested as potential ingredients for Greek fire, oftentimes including the ingredients that are needed for gunpowder. Fortunately, now I've done a few videos videos now sourcing and extracting and purifying the compounds needed for that, which include sulfur, saltpeter, and charcoal. Another common ingredient included in recipes is pine resin, which Heldon also suggested could have been used. Some recipes even suggest the use of ethanol, which is distilled alcohol. All these ingredients I have now, but as Heldon confirmed, the most important ingredient and potentially the only ingredient I'll need to attempt to recreate Greek fire is a source of raw petroleum. Like the ancient Greeks who lost control of the specific oil fields they used, I also do not have access to many oil fields. Most oil deposits today are owned and being actively drilled, and despite reaching out to many of them now, I can never really get a response. So getting actual access to a natural source is going to be a little difficult. However, there are a few areas in the world where petroleum will just leak out of the ground. California actually has several locations like that. Some are right on a public beach. But the oil there is pretty well dried out and not going to be ideal. But further inland, I had sights on a better possible source. I'm in uh, the Central Valley of California, right near McKittrick. I'm looking for a tar pit because I want to collect some asphalt to make Greek fire. So here we have a placard that marks the actual location of a tar pit, except not really because it's uh, about an eighth of a mile west, it says. So I have to do a little bit of exploring. An eighth of a mile in. This is about where the tar pit is supposed to be. So using the drone, I was able to find some sort of seepage and kind of a black river. It looks pretty promising. All right, so we got some obvious seepage here. I think we have uh, petroleum. Oh yeah, it's like freshly paved road. My shoes are going to be sticky. Right, I think I'm gonna go down to the large area I saw, see if there's a much larger collection there. So here's the, the seepage I saw from the camera, and it's a pretty big pool here. Got a pretty, pretty decent sample of stuff. Not sure if a lot of it is dirt or if it's just all asphalt. It's all pretty gooey. Officially tarred myself, now I just need some feathers. So I'm back from California with the tar seep that I collected. Kind of the issue I'm gonna run into here is that petroleum, raw petroleum, as it comes out of the earth, is different depending on what part of the earth you're at. The type of oil we're really after from this region supposedly was very light. These are pretty thick. I also ended up buying this several years ago now, straight crude oil from Texas. So to try to extract some of the lighter petroleum products, we're gonna just do a bit of fractal distillation, which is basically what happens in an oil refinery when they take raw crude petroleum and turn it into gasoline, kerosene, asphalt, basically every petroleum product is just separated by their boiling points. See what we can extract from this. Hopefully get us something a little bit lighter, something a little bit more similar to what you'd find at the source for the Byzantines. So our first test, just gonna set it on fire. This is the stuff I collected from California. It's pretty thick. Look at this stuff from Texas. This is actually a bit thinner. It's a good sign. Let's see how well they burn. Not that flammable off the go. That's on fire. I think just because we have so many other different compounds in there, not all of it is flammable. So it almost has to boil off some of them. Before I can light that. This one does not want to burn. Oh, yeah, a little bit. Wow, that's not as flammable as I expected.
So the first attempt at trying to distill the crude oil was pretty successful. Started to get some separation. Unfortunately, had a lot of burping. We have a stir bar in there that's supposed to be stirring it up, but I think it's just, even when hot, it's still fairly thick. Unfortunately, that contaminated our initial results. I think mostly we we're just getting the water out to start with. So to hopefully solve this, just got some boiling chips. It'll help boiling to start at a lot of different spots at once rather than one big bubble. So hopefully we're gonna have a little bit better results and I think try and keep it uh, very slow heat. And hopefully we can extract some of the lighter petroleum products. After distilling for roughly 12 hours, we have a result. A very strange orange amber color, which I think is actually kind of promising for some of the descriptions of the type of raw crude oil that they collected from some of the sources they used to make Greek fire. So I wasn't able to do too close of a measurement of the exact temperatures that I extracted to. So I'm not entirely sure what all I have here. I'm saying it's most likely kerosene, probably some gasoline, and maybe up to diesel. I think the only downside is that there might also be some water that was initially extracted. I think my first attempt probably got off some of the water, but there possibly was some more so I don't know how flammable this is. Let's do a little flame test and see if this uh, is flammable now. That is flammable. Much more flammable than before. So I think that's a good sign. We have something potentially potent. Another ingredient that many have theorized as being included is quicklime. But there are a lot of theories of what Greek fire could be. And one of the more prominent ones is that it was self-igniting when put on water. So the chief ingredient for making actual self-igniting is quicklime, which is uh, made from limestone that's been roasted. This stuff is famous for reacting violently with water in a very exothermic reaction, where you can produce a lot of heat. When this compound is added to water, we can reach temperatures up to three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a pretty high temperature, which will ignite some things, but not necessarily everything we have. So let's put this to the test. We have our quick lime here. We can measure the temperature, see how high we can get, and then we can see if we can add some other additives to it to ignite at that temperature. Skeptical this will work. Maybe we can get some kind of result. So let's try it out. Temperature-wise, we are starting at uh, about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. 60, 50, 55, 55. Not very hot, really. 70. Karina is 70 here. 80. Overall, it's made the water uh, maybe a couple degrees warmer. Yeah, so that's not very hopeful. I, th I think the water is almost instantly cooling it back down. I'm not sure how we can make this work. Well, it, uh, we can mess around with it a little bit more. So looking into it, quick lime maxes out at around 150 to 100 degrees Celsius, which really limits the amount of chemicals that it can actually ignite, as even sulfur, which is added to gunpowder to lower its ignition temperature, requires a higher temperature than that. So actually igniting something at that theoretical maximum is gonna be difficult. But there are a few chemicals that do ignite at that temperature, and at least in my estimate, the most theoretically achievable at that time period is ether. Historically, ether was discovered potentially as early as the 8th century, which is a little late, but does coincide with the use of Greek fire. Ether can be made by reacting and distilling two chemicals, in theory, available to Byzantine Greeks, ethanol and sulfuric acid. A roughly 2 to 1 ratio of ethanol to sulfuric acid just needs to be mixed together and then heated to around 140 to 150 degrees Celsius. It will auto-ignite at a temperature around 160 degrees degrees Celsius, which is in within the range of the maximum temperature quick lime will react with water. The exact process can require some extra steps to ensure purity, but since we're only really looking for the explosive properties, a down and dirty method will suffice. Ether, of course, is known to be an early anesthetic that was used to knock out patients. And to test it, I used it on a fly that conveniently volunteered. surgery. He's alive. Look at that. This leaves us with a decent list of ingredients that may have theoretically been used. Now to mix up some concoctions and actually put them to the test. For our first test, we're going to put them into glass grenades that we can light and drop as a test. 
All of our recipes should, in theory, be flammable. And if used like a standard Molotov cocktail, it should be at least somewhat effective at setting a fire. The real test, though, is going to be the inclusion of water. Just a little water, and many of these will likely get extinguished right away, or be very limited on how much they even burn. A true candidate for Greek fire should both ignite easily in water, stay lit on top of the water, and then be hard to extinguish with water after ignited. So these are the main aspects we'll be testing for. But for our test, we need something to burn. For that, I got a new toy to try out. OM Tech sent me their Polar 350 to try out, and it's honestly been a really cool new tool to add to our repertoire. Perhaps a bit more advanced to actually use on any of the main video builds, but I've already found some great uses for it for making my own custom merch, and in this case, I was able to use it to design my own laser cut boat that could quickly cut out and then assemble, giving us a nice target to set on fire. And if you're interested in checking out this laser cutter yourself, check out the link in the description. <laughs> the result ended up being a lot better than I expected, so I was hesitant to actually set on fire. So I'm going to save that for the very end. First up, we went for a straight crude petroleum using the slightly more flammable oil from Texas. This is mostly a control to see if just any crude oil without any processing would fulfill the description of Greek fire. Surprisingly, this stuff did not want to burn, even with a direct flame applied. So the Texas stuff was slightly flammable. It's like not as flammable as you would expect. Good uh, oil does not work. Second, another control is distilled ethanol alone. We know this works in your classic Molotov cocktail, but with the elements of water, it clearly became a lot less effective and very far from the descriptions of Greek fire. Whoa, <laughs> that one didn't break. My alcohol. You're kidding me. Right? Yeah. Then next is the California Petroleum that I distilled out of a lighter oil. This is, in theory, what is closest to the oil fields the Byzantine would have collected from historically, and based on my discussion with John Heldon, probably going to be the most effective result. The first attempt ended up losing the flame, but once ignited, clearly exhibited its difficulty in extinguishing it. Whoa. This is just water? <laughs> yeah. It makes it worse. Yeah, oil fire. Clearly exhibited the behavior of being very difficult to extinguish. But the second attempt was oh. very effective. <laughs> Holy cow. It's gonna be hard to beat that result. The only other ingredient John Heldon suggested that could have been added was pine resin. So we'll try that mix next. Ooh. The end result was pretty similar, with the resin potentially diminishing just how much it actually spread. Next is based on a contemporary account by Byzantine princess Anna Komanini, who described Greek fire as a combination of pine resin and sulfur. There's fire. Definitely flammable and left a sticky mess, but didn't really want to stay lit when it was in the water. Some people describe this as an incomplete recipe, so we also tried a version that added some of the distilled oil as well. Oh. Okay. <laughs> My grass! <laughs> so I don't think the vial broke, but... Next, let's try some with gunpowder ingredients. First oil was sulfur and saltpeter. This made a decent fireball, but overall the gunpowder ingredients seem to only diminish the results, if any. Oh, there it is. Then what's well, basically gunpowder and ethanol. I expected a dud for this one, as ethanol is often used when you're milling gunpowder to prevent ignition. Oh, it's oh yeah. <laughs> but this ended up actually being a bit more flammable than I expected. Interesting. 
This one's staying. Is, bur is it burning on the water too? Not really. Next is another recipe, this one from the 16th century in Italy, which involves a wide amount of ingredients, including charcoal, saltpeter, alcohol, sulfur, tar, and even wool. The inclusion of wool seemed confusing, but after igniting, it became apparent the pieces of it operated basically like sticky pieces of napalm, which naturally wick the flammable ingredients, making it difficult to extinguish with water. Then we tried one without any petroleum in it, just to see if there was a possible solution they could have used after losing access to the oil fields. It used pine resin, sulfur, charcoal, and animal fat. Ah. Then lastly, the attempt at a self-igniting recipe using quicklime and ether. In theory, when the quicklime contacts the water, it'll quickly produce heat. If it can reach a temperature of 160 degrees Celsius or 320 degrees Fahrenheit, the ether should auto-ignite. In theory, it could work, but I think the pool of water is just gonna cool the quicklime before it can reach that full maximum potential. On impact, you can hear the cracking as the quicklime reacts with water to produce heat, but it never achieved enough heat to self-ignite. If it had, this might have actually made a very promising result, as the ether burned very well on top of the water. Unless there is another chemical they could have used, I think the use of quicklime here is bunk. So in conclusion, I think the testing showed some really interesting results. For the most part, I think that we can confirm what John Heldon told me. Lighter petroleum oil was likely the main ingredient of Greek fire, if not the only ingredient. Some of the other supposed recipes and ingredients did seem to show decent potential, but nothing seemed to really improve the results versus just straight petroleum. This is obviously not a perfect test, and there are countless other combinations of potential chemicals that we could be experimenting with. If anybody thinks they have some better suggestions of combinations or ingredients or methods for testing, let me know about in the comments, and I'll see about doing a follow-up if we get some good suggestions. With a relatively clear winner, let's put it to the next test against my little boat. Using a quick simulation of the device we'll need to replicate in an upcoming video, a delivery device that will spray the chemical as an aerosol. <laughs> I don't really need this anymore. <laughs> And as always, thank you to my current supporters on Patreon. You guys all make this possible. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.